Welcome to the Jack Murphy Media YouTube channel, the media channel with no limits. In today's episode of Talking Life, I speak with footballer, father, husband and foster dad, Dean Cox. Dean started his career at Brighton and Hope Albion with loan spells at Eastbourne Borough and Bodmer Regis. Before moving to Leighton Orient in 2010, making over 220 appearances and scoring 45 competitive goals in a six year spell for the O's. Since then he's had spells at Burgess Hill Town, Crawley Town and currently plays for former lonely club Eastbourne Borough. This is Dean Cox, this is his life, this is Talking Life. Well, hello there and welcome to the Jake Murphy Media YouTube channel, the media channel with no limits, and to this Talking Life series, episode two with Dean Cox. Now, uh, first of all, Dean Cox was a childhood hero of mine, a Leighton Orient legend, and uh, we're going to delve into his career, mostly about his career within Leighton Orient, and of course, speak about his life outside of football. But I guess the first question is in these current times, how are you finding the COVID and the lockdown? Yeah, very different, mate. I think obviously football wise with no fans is is different. Um, same for every club, though. I must I must say, but yeah, to to get to grips with coming out and nobody being there is it's been it's been difficult. Um, obviously, at home with, uh, with the family, it's been challenging with kids. So I uh, had to keep them busy a bit of homeschooling, which has been different for me. Um, so uh, yeah, just trying to keep busy. Keep as positive as we can because you know it's, there's no shame in people will get down in these times because it, it's just not normal. You know you're not able to to go and do what you want to go and do. So it's been uh, it's been challenging, but one I've tried to embrace and obviously try and get used to on and off the pitch really, mate. So we're going to touch um, on the uh, children's side of it towards the end of the podcast. But let's just go through some of your stats. Um, most these are the most up to date stats, anyway, so they may not be a hundred percent correct. So, um, for Brighton, in terms of your senior career, you were there from 2005 to 2010. Yes, I am reading these, so there's no way I remember all of them. And uh, <laughs> you made up 179 appearances, scoring 22 goals during that time. You had a loan spell at Eastbourne Borough, so your current club now, we'll come on to that later, making 13 appearances with zero goals. 2006, you made one loan appearance for uh, Bognor Regis and then obviously joined to how I got to know who Dean Cox was in 2010 to 2016, obviously with Leighton Orient, making 275 appearances in all competitions, also I don't think that includes friendlies, and scoring 59 goals at just one shot in the 60th. And yeah. then in 2016, 2018, you was at Crawley Town, making 27 appearances, scoring two goals, and it classes as a loan with Burgess Hill with nine appearances and four goals. Obviously, we'll come into that later on. And then, obviously, currently at uh, Eastbourne Borough, had, um, you've been there since 2018, making 82 appearances so far and scoring 19 goals, which in total gives you 586 competitive games and 106 goals, which is quite a lot for a left winger. Yeah, no, I'm impressed with that. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, I, I, knew, it, I knew it'd be close. I didn't know an exact number but I, I knew it'd be in and around that so yeah no obviously like you say for a wide player to to get over 100 goals I'm yeah I'm absolutely delighted with that mate to be honest yeah definitely and then so what we'll do we'll take you back we'll take you to your youth career at Brighton um I can't actually find the year you started there I know you obviously left in 2005 so from podcasts I've listened to with um footballers um in their youth career there was like a YTS scheme did you kind of be able to do the YTS or was you in like the back end of that? Yeah, no. So I signed for Brighton when I was six, um, six years old. So I played with them and still played with my local side, Cookfield Cosmos, all the way up to the age of 16. Um, I remember that being quite a hard time, you having to choose one or the other when it got that serious that you had to, you know, sort of come away from your mates, with, you know, that you've grown up with and, and love playing with 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 obviously playing uh, more competitive for Brighton, but yeah, no, so did that, and obviously yeah, did my YTS was uh, at Brighton, uh, three years scholarship, um, two days uh, college uh, alongside that, and yeah, like you say, obviously f through those three years was 
you know, trying to forge my way like every other young young man that, that was at the same sort of stage, trying to, to earn myself a pro contract. Did I think I'd get one? Probably not. Um, when I, if I'm honest, from the outset, uh, it was competitive. Um, it was, you know, relentless, really. You're training every day. And as much as they're your mates, you know the end game is, is you want a pro contract and you know they want it as well. And obviously it was difficult. I remember the day they actually gave them out. We all sat in the changing room and we were called upstairs, as it was at, at Brighton, uh, where the manager would be with uh, the youth team manager and uh, basically t- t- taken up them, them stairs and, and told whether or not you were, you know, whether or not you were going to get a professional contract or not. And obviously it's not always good news. And, you know, I remember seeing boys coming down crying and, you know, difficult. It was really difficult to see. But like I said, it was that, that element of you, you're obviously all mates, but obviously the end game was, you know, to get that, to get that precious professional contract. When you obviously I listen to the Under the Cost podcast a lot with uh, like players such as John Parkin, who's one of the hosts, which I know you've come against a couple of times in your career, their guests say the YTS is almost like a baptism from fire. You have to clean the boots. There was a lot of what they call banter, but probably now you consider it bullying. Did a lot of that go on in your time or was that kind of faded out by then? Yeah, I'd say, yeah, no, I was, I was told to clean toilets, uh, boots, you know, uh, Professionals would come in and, you know, literally throw the boots at you and tell you to go and clean them, you know. I think if you've done that in this day and age, like you say, the, the bullying, bullying element would, would most certainly be be flagged up. But in those days, it was, um, I suppose it was the norm. Um, you know, you were expected to get on with it. Um, so, yeah, you used to just, yeah, you would be the first in there cleaning the change rooms, making sure the balls and bibs and, and the goals were set out how the, how the manager wanted it. You'd, you'd get sent down instructions uh, early morning uh, and you had a set time to get them done by. Then obviously you'd then go train yourself and uh, you would then obviously wait for the first team to finish. You'd clean their change rooms, clean their boots, you know, like I said, toilets. You know, some pros wanted their cars cleaned before they went home. So, you know, all sorts of things were, 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 and you just had to go with it really. Um and like you say, I think it's uh, it's definitely changed since I was a YTS t- till now, that's for sure. And then obviously you make that breakthrough, like you alluded to, getting that contract as a professional contract with Brighton. And you was obviously there for five years from 2005 to 2010 in a professional aspect of it anyway. What was the kind of your thoughts and feelings behind becoming a professional and almost was it daunting that first game you played for the first team going from like, Obviously, I'm guessing natural uh, possession is question rather is going from YTS reserve and then into first team. Can you like go to your first ever game as a professional and how that felt? Yeah, I can remember it vividly. Yeah, definitely. I, I remember um, I had been training with the first team a couple of days and I knew that we knew of some injuries, knew of some suspensions and. Uh, the youth team manager did sort of say to us that there might be half a chance and didn't name anybody, but just said there might be half a chance of someone being involved or, 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 or even starting. Um, and then I remember it was Mark McGee at the time, uh, Scottish uh, voice telling me to come and train with him. So I was thinking, oh, OK, so this is good. I mean, I didn't think anything of it because I had been training with him. So I thought, oh, great, great experience to go and train with with older pros uh, and experienced first team players. So I went over, I trained okay. I wouldn't have said uh, anything special if I'm honest. Um, and I just remember sitting in the dressing room on my own and him just poking his head round and just saying, listen, son, you, you, you're playing tomorrow. And I, I just thought, oh my God, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> I remember just saying, really? <laughs> um, so uh, he said, yeah, you, you're playing, you're starting. I said, oh, okay, fine. You know, obviously buzzing, get home, tell my mum and dad and, I think, you know, I didn't sleep that night, that's for sure. I was thinking, oh, my God, you know, am I ready? I don't know, am I? Who knows? I've trained my best. I, I try my best. You know, it's one of them. You sort of, an old saying that Martin Hinchwood used to say, uh, you either sink or swim. You know, it's one of them. You're thrown in the deep end and, uh, you know, you either cope with it or you don't. And um, f- for me, obviously, on my day, but I ended up getting sent off. So uh, <laughs> all of the 
all, all of the, uh, you know, the worry come true, really. You know, I, those are the things you think of. Don't get sent off. Don't do anything stupid. Don't, you know, don't give a penalty away or don't score an own goal. Or, but um, obviously don't get sent off. And, and for me, I think it was, it was only about 41 minutes into the game and I got sent off. Uh, fortunately enough, we won. But um, yeah, I remember getting an absolute grilling from from uh, the manager and the youth team manager at the time that obviously helped me on my way to sort of get me into to a first team environment. And uh, I must admit, I, from then on, I, I think that as, as as funny as it sounds, it, I think it did stand me in good stead. You know, I, I'd realised my opportunity, and obviously to, to to get sent off, obviously he, he, he's obviously not the best thing to do, but. Yeah. Um, after that suspension, I, you know, I'd like to think I'll, I'll bounce back, and um, you know, I made a few appearances after that. So, so we fast forward the five years or five, uh, five and a bit years, and on the second of June two thousand and ten, you signed for Lake Laurie, and this, we hear about this young winger coming in from um, from Brighton. See Brighton doing well at the time, and. So really, obviously, it was one. You was one of Russell Slade's signings. How did the move to Lake Norian come about? Um, yeah, it was it, obviously Russ. I say Russ. I should call him Gaffer. Really, uh, the Gaffer gave me a call, and you know, obviously, had, had managed me at Brighton. Had, had seen I hadn't been playing, and uh, Russ being Russ, you know, do you want to meet for a beer? Classic Russ, that is. So. Uh, I remember just get, saying, yeah, no, you know, let's, let's, let's talk about it. And, uh, yeah, so I met him in London. Um, we had a few beers. Um, you know, he, he then took me around the ground and and, 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 and sold it to me, really. Um, obviously, for me, it was big because it was moving home as well as moving from my hometown club, which was, you know, upsetting for me. You know, I'd, like I said, I was there from six years old. So, so then getting the first team and then, for me to have to move on was sad, but obviously that 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 is football. But you know, obviously very thankful that Russ gave me the call. And uh, like I said, yeah, we met. He, he spoke about his plans and 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 how he saw me fit in. And um, always remember him saying, look, you know, trust me, this would be the best decision you make. And you know, if, if he if he told me the things that I'd experienced at, at Leighton Orient at the time I was there, I would have said, you know, get lost, Gaffer. You know, you, you, you're talking rubbish, but. You know, he was true to his word and, you know, I had, I had such a fantastic time. So, obviously, you've signed, you've gone through that um, day with Russell Slade. What was your first day at Leighton Orient like and how easy was it to fit in with, like, the um, characters within the dressing room? Yeah, I mean, difficult. I'm, you know, I'm not going to lie. It was difficult. It was... I, I had to move out home, so I was adjusting to that, you know. Silly things like making your own making your own meals, you know, it's, it, uh, doing your own washing and, uh, you know, acclimatising to all of that. But like you say, to turn up and um, new kid on the block, um, I wanted to make a good impression. You know, I, I, Russ just said, be yourself. He said, you know, you're, you're an infectious character. Be yourself. He said, they love you. And, and, and to be fair, it probably took me a good sort of six months, perhaps, to, to really find my feet, uh, get used to, like I say, living on my own and, and, and and then obviously being around different players and different different characters and people's thoughts are different and, and, and how people play and, and just fitting in, you know, as a person as well as a player. And, uh, you know, Russ helped me, you know, enormously. He went above and beyond, really. You know, he used to sometimes, you know, I'd be on, you know, on my own. It, 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 we'd have dinner at his flat at the ground. It was well documented that he, you know, he lived on the side of the ground, I used to go around there just for a cup of tea, just to get me out. You know, sometimes it was difficult, um, obviously. And, uh, you know, not, not, not every manager out there would, would do certain things like that. And, but he, for whatever reason, me and Russ always hit it off. As soon as he took over at Brighton, and obviously, you know, everyone knows how close we were at, um, at Leighton Orient. He, you know, he was a second dad, really, in some aspects. It helped me with anything. Um, you know, and I can't speak highly enough of him, but yeah, it was difficult, like I said, to, 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 to mix in with the boys. But I think once um, I got my feet in and I started playing a few games and showed what I could do, uh, you know, you have to earn the respect to your team. And I think that that slowly grew 
in, in time that, you know, the amount of games that I ended up playing. And you certainly did almost hit the ground running. Your first league goal for Orient was a 3-0 victory over Exeter, which I vaguely remember, on the 28th of August in 2010. What was the feeling of getting that first goal? Was it a moment of euphoria? Or was it almost a moment of relief that, right, I've done, got the goal now and I can actually progress and kick on? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both, mate. I think, you know... Uh... First goal, the fans are expecting, you know, to, 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 for you to come and do well. So, obviously, for me, I mean, obviously, I remember the goal. I think it was a long ball. I think uh, Scotty McLeish laid it inside. And I think I've I've put it into the, the sort of top left-hand corner. I remember the celebration running over to Russ, obviously. Um, you know, it helped me so much. And like you say, that sort of emotion takes over. And, uh, you know, I run over to him and, you know shouting in his ear thanks very much you know because uh, at the point when I was at Brighton you know I wasn't playing I'm not sure where where my career would have gone really if, if it wasn't for him and you know he believed in me and obviously you know that that moment was was, was a special one. And when you started at Orion obviously you played on the left side in front of Charlie Daniels now it seemed that automatically from day one in my memory anyway you had a great connection on the pitch. Was the connection on the pitch the same as it was off the pitch? Did you get on as well off the pitch? Was you friends or was it almost like you just come in and just played well together? Yeah, I, I, Charlie was a fantastic lad. I wouldn't say we, we were best mates, um, but once we stepped forward on that pitch, I think it was a, it was a case of under, he understood me and I understood him. And, you know, certain situations... You know, I'd roll inside, get the ball, and I'd always know it overlap me, and, and and vice versa. And you know, Charlie was fantastic, and obviously went on and played in the Premier League. And but yeah, fantastic player, especially for me. You know, was never the quickest. Um, obviously, I'd like to think you know more clever, come inside, get my shots off, and and you know lay people in with me assists and stuff. And and Charlie was obviously an overlapping fullback, which worked well. You know, if you have a quick winger that wants to take people on 1v1 then an overlapping fullback sometimes doesn't work but I think it just sort of clicked and uh, like I said you know in time it got it just got better and better and we've got some stats about your first season this is one that's going to be kind of in depth this season because obviously it was the season which we got to the FA Cup fifth round replay the 2010-11 season um, obviously like I said we had that ep epic FA Cup run but a question is going to be about the Lonies. Obviously, we had Tottenham Lonies in the form of Harry Kane, Tommy Cavill and Paul Josie and Poku. Now, from a fan's perspective, it looked like Harry Kane, he wasn't a bad player, but probably the less progressed out of the three players that we had on loan from Spurs. Obviously, you set him up with your, his first ever senior goal from a free kick against Sheffield Wednesday, which we won 4-0. But as a player, did you see Harry Kane becoming one of the best strikers in the world that he is now at that time? No, no, there's no way. Um, and that's not being disrespectful to Harry because, you know, credit to him, he's, uh, he's, he's on another planet at the minute. You know, he's, he is world class. But at the time, like you say, quite rightly say, Tommy Carroll and uh, Mpoku were, I would say, like you say, better than him. You know, there's no two ways about it. Um, but uh, the only thing that ever did stick out with Harry was he, he used to love doing crossing and finishing. He used to shoot. You know, I remember Russ having to shout at him to get in. You know, he, he would take a bag of balls out early. And, you know, he he was dedicated to his trade. That That is one thing I would say. But to go on and do what he's done is, is absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, he is, like I said, world class, the best striker out there by for me, uh, a country mile. Uh, he, you know, his all-round game now as well. He's adapted into that. You know, his, his, his assists record this season's fantastic. He's just a complete striker, and uh, it's uh, it's very good to see because, like you say, you remember him coming to Orient, and you know, young lad. You know, he done well for us. He scored a few goals, but you know, to be England captain and you know the goals he scored is just. Uh, I mean, I suppose if someone asked him that, would he expect that he would have done it? I think he'd, you know, he'd probably say no. But like I said, credit to him, you know, he, he, he's world class. 
So like I mentioned, obviously that was the season we had those three loanies. It was the season that we got to the FA Cup fifth round replay, eventually lost 5-0 away to Arsenal or the Emirates. But what actually may have faded from memory, and to be fair, almost faded from my memory until I researched it, we ended up finishing seventh in um, League One, one side out of the playoffs. So at that season, we started... Uh, very poorly, really. We only picked up four points in seven games. And in the next 13 league games, we won five games, drew five and lost three, um, concluding with a 5-0 uh, defeat on New Year's Day, uh, away to your former club, Brighton, that went on to win the league, um, obviously with 95 points that season. Actually, a game that I remember listening to on the radio and it was just sounded like it wasn't our day. But then, from then... That was almost a turnaround. And then we went unbeaten for 14 games in the league. And during that time, we also had our FA Cup victories against Norwich, Swansea, and both games against Arsenal. During that kind of period of time, what was the catalyst for all these great results all of a sudden? Yeah, I think, I think what we did do is use the cup run to, to galvanise us, uh, you know, galvanise us, sorry. Um, and yeah, just use that good form and, and, and took it into the league. I remember, remember we started off really badly um, and uh, I remember, you know, using that, the FA Cup, like I said, I remember Russ sort of saying, look, we've got to use this to sort of give us a springboard to go and, you know, compete better in the league. And like you say, we, we, would, we fell just short of uh, the playoffs. And, you know, I felt when, when I come in that, that we sort of built building blocks sort of in stages. Um, he was building a squad and... Um, and I think we, we gradually got better and better. And I just think, yeah, that at that time, it was it, it was just that bit better than than the start of the season. I just think, like I said, we were doing it in stages and, and uh, it was a good season for us. We finished well and, and we were obviously after that, we, we, we wanted to kick on again. And then following them results, obviously we get knocked out from Arsenal, uh, against Arsenal, shall I say. Um, so the, it was a mixed bag for the remainder of the season. We won four, we drew two, we lost six, including a 5-1 defeat away to Yeovil. Now, our last home game of the season, we played Tranmere. So second to last game of our last home game. We lost 3-0. And obviously that was a game in which if we would have won, in hindsight, we would have made the playoffs because we beat Plymouth 4-1 away on the last day. Do you remember the feelings around the camp in that final home game? And also following that, the uh, any funny stories from that uh, famous trip to Las Vegas? Yeah, I think yeah, we know obviously that we we had um, you know, shot ourselves in the foot with the defeat. I think you know it was very flat, um, and yeah, a sense of yeah, like I said, massive disappointment. Really, you know, you, you play so many games. To, to, to hopefully get into that top seven to get yourselves a chance to get yourselves in the playoffs or, or promoted or whatever, if you can. Um, and yeah, you, you sit there and think, oh, you know, one game away, it's, you know, you're, you're sick as a pig, really. All that hard work coming down to, to sort of one result. But uh, yeah, like you said, Las Vegas, um, Barry Earn, what a chairman, what a man. Um, you know, I, I wish he'd stayed there the whole time I was there. Um, obviously, what happened? I'm sure we get onto that. But yeah. Um, yeah, he was he was he was fantastic. Him and Eddie at the time that was involved a little bit, but he was sort of more on, to, on going on to the boxing. But I mean, to to play for them, you know, they're such characters. Um, and Barry, you know, treated us like we were kings. I think mean, that's the only way I could say in Vegas. You know, we hardly spent a penny. Um, so you know, he, he treated the boys. You know, he was true to his word. Um, and, you know, I think I think when he first said it, I think everyone thought he was telling a white lie, to be honest. I was one of them. And uh, to be fair to him, you know, stuck by his word and, and, and treated the boys. And, you know, the boys are forever thankful for that. And was there, I don't know if you can actually say, I don't want you to get anyone in trouble, but was there any shenanigans that went on in Las Vegas? Anyone passing out black drunk or anything like that? Yeah. Well, there is a saying, isn't there? Whatever happens in Vegas stays there. So I'll, I'll bet I'll better not shoot the boys in the foot. But uh, I can assure you, we had a very good time. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a conversation we have off the uh, recording. 
Yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we then go into your second season, into the 2011-12 season. And we it was a weird season, really. It was one where we played 46 league games. We won 13 and we drew um, drew 11 and we lost 22, finishing on 50 points, just above the relegation zone. But there was some good games in that season. We went on almost a little spell. So it took up until the 1st of October to get our first league win. And we beat Preston 2-1 at home with a brace for yourself, which was the second of nine games unbeaten. So the questions I have from them period of games is, A, because I certainly remember it as a 14, 15-year-old lad, the Preston game where you've done a knee slide celebration in front of our season tickets and the groundsman comes out at half time absolutely furious because you've dug up the turf. And then also, do you remember the atmosphere of that 96th minute equaliser from Kevin Lisby against Sheffield United at home? Yeah, the knee, I remember getting told off actually. The, the, the Russ pulled me and said, Oh, you've got to stop knee sliding. I said, What do you mean? He said, oh, the groundsman's not too happy with the pitch. I said, Well, I was just celebrating the goal, but yeah, he was mucking about. But yeah, no, I remember it. I remember the goals, actually. I think one was a header and one was in off the post. I'm sure it was. And I remember I remember seeing you in the crowd, actually. Yeah. I remember seeing it. Um, and I remember sliding and everyone coming in. And yeah, I, I mean, it was great. And going on to, to Kevin's goal, God, I remember that, definitely. You remember that roar. Um, if there's one thing I do miss, and it's definitely uh, that, that roar when a goal goes in at, at, at Brisbane Road. Um, you know, it's uh, it was a feeling that you know I, I never wanted to go. It was uh, it was special, and like I said, you know, Kev, to play with Kevin Lisby as well, you know, an absolute dream to be honest. You know, to, you know, Premier League player with Charlton, uh, the experience and the uh, I think I think what he gave me was was confidence more than anything as well. He, but you, uh, to believe in yourself, you know, he always used to say, if you can't, you know. If, if you don't believe in yourself, then who's going to believe in you? You know, and uh, not not with an arrogance, but with with you know, when you go on the pitch, you know, you are a good player, and you, you know, you you can deliver and you can score goals. And I just remember him always, you know, always saying to me, "Be that spark, be that spark." Before every game, you know, he used to say the same things, but always ingrained in you. And uh, yeah, like I said, it was it was a pleasure to play with him. And we go to the final game that season, and we played Rochdale at home. Um, a game, if we would have lost, we could have gone down, depending on Wickham's result. I think on goal difference, potentially. But we won 2-1 and stayed up. I remember everyone singing, we are staying up. What were your memories from that final day win? Because you've gone from a season of, obviously we've done well in the FA Cup, but a season of, damn, we've nearly missed the playoffs and, oh my God, we gutted. So almost, mm. was it euphoria that we'd stayed up? Or was it almost, oh my God, thank God for that? Yeah, I think relief more than anything. I think we'd we'd had such a close knit in getting into the playoffs, and I do think that affected our start. I think mentally, we thought, oh, you know, after all that, and we still didn't get no rewards for it, and probably you know a, a, a lack of concentration, a lack, lack of quality, obviously, to to, to to be where we were in the league. And uh, yeah, it was more absolute relief, and you know, we don't want to be in this position again, really, and. Um, you know, sort of move on and, and, and hopefully, you know, uh, we, we better times were to come. And a question I have to ask, because my friend would kill me if I don't, I think it was around this season. My, obviously, me being a Leighton Orient fan, you take your friends from school because obviously it was cheap to go down there. It was a good day out. He decided to make a room on my friend Stefan that you were leaving to go to Peterborough for 500k. And I actually remember you having to tweet out but this wasn't the case. You're staying at Leighton Orient. But do you remember that type, that actual uh, conspiracy that you was leaving? Yeah, well, I mean, I've never said it, but it was actually true. Um, so I remember Barry Barry Earn telling me um, that he had accepted a five hundred thousand pound bid from Peterborough, um, and obviously, for me, it was you know we just had a good season. Just missed out on, on on going getting to the championship. I know Peterborough, to be fair, were in the championship. Um, you know, sometimes the grass isn't always greener, and you know, I, I didn't really have much thinking time. I, I sort of said to him that you know, I'm, I'm happy where I am. Um, I don't want to go. 
Um, and Barry said, well, listen, you know, I have the weekend to think about it. And I remember saying to him, look, Barry, it's not going to change. But obviously, I'll let you know on Monday. This was the Friday after training. Um, remember speaking to Russ and, and Russ saying, look, it's a great opportunity. But, you know, I want you to stay. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get the begging bowl out, but I want you to stay, mate. And I know the lads have wanted you to stay, but if you want to go and fulfil, you know, your dream of playing in the championship, nobody can begrudge you that. Um, you've given good service. And, you know, it took, it took a lot of thinking time, if I'm honest, in terms of, not in the terms of, uh, just in terms of being able to play in the championship was, was, was in the back of my mind. But I suppose in the forefront was you, you're enjoying your football. This, you know, this club's given you the opportunity to, to fulfil your potential. You know, you've just you've played at Wembley, you've just scored, all right, you've, 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 you've lost um, and you're going to be playing in League One again, but you know, you're at a club where you're, you're valued, you're loved. I mean, the fans with me were, I mean, I, I've never felt so loved in all my life, other than with my missus, you know. <laughs> they were just, you know, I felt every time I walked out on that pitch, you know, they were right behind me, you know, and uh, that was in the forefront of my mind. So, do you, do you go and play in the championship? Is it a risk or do you stay where, you know, I was playing and playing well, um, getting, like I said, you've mentioned we, we had experiences against Arsenal in the FA Cup. Mm. Um, you know, I'd experienced so much and I think really I just didn't want it to stop. And I, I, I did feel, I mean, uh, how wrong I was, I know, but after after being in the championship, uh, play, League One, sorry, playoff final, and losing that, that we'd we'd hopefully go one step further the following year. Obviously, it didn't didn't materialise, but you know I stand by my decision. I don't regret it at all, and you know that that that, that was that story really. So we, we'll go over that in more detail. But it's actually interesting because of the time codes of it that come true. But obviously, when Stefan said this as a joke, this was three years previously, and it almost did seem. So I don't know whether on. The inside, you did actually get a bid every single season for 500k from Peterborough, but it almost seemed like that rumor went round every single year. There was at least two that I know about. I mean, I don't know anymore. I know there was two, um, so that's that, that's what I know. I don't know. You know, Barry may well know more, but I, I only knew of two. So, and and obviously twice twice turned it down. So, yeah, obviously that was obviously the rumours going round, so it could just be my friend was psychic, but he'd love the fact you've actually addressed that. So we move into <laughs> the season. It's the 2012-13 season. We played 46 uh, league games. We won 21. We drew 14 with 71 points, three points away from the playoffs. And you could have almost got a historic goal. At the time, it was a historic goal, the final goal at the Repo Arena uh, when we beat Coventry 1-0. Because uh, obviously, they got booted out, but obviously, we got back in. But this season yeah. was actually a season where Wembley was only one game away in the JPT. And I guess it's a trophy where before the Premier League Academy teams come in, but we won't get onto that debacle. But it was actually a kind of renowned trophy for the lower leagues. So to refresh your memory in that competition, we uh, had a buy in the first round. We beat Barnet 1-0 at home in the second. We beat Northampton 3-0 away in the third. Yeovil 1-0 at home in the fourth round with a 90th minute winner from David Mooney. And obviously I remember that was a time where he was struggling for form. And I think it was that goal that kick-started his goal scoring kind of spell with Leighton Oregon um, first time round. Uh, which was absolute scenes. I remember Barry Hearn shouting, down, we go, we go to Wembley, if we go mad. <laughs> it then comes to what is technically the semi-final, but what they call the area final over two legs. We lost 1-0 to Southend at home, which we also had a goal from Jimmy Smith, I believe, that was disallowed, which should have never been disallowed. And then we drew two all away. Which meant, unfortunately, we did get knocked out. Um, we... What were your memories and feelings from particularly the JPT that season? Yeah, I think at that point, like you quite rightly say, it was a, a big competition because any chance to get to Wembley is, is, is nothing to be 
to be sniffed at, and we we, we were desperate. And uh, obviously, South End being quite a rival of ours, we knew how important it was. And I think you know, obviously, the result didn't come, and uh, you know, we let the fans down there really because you know we had a good team. Uh, I believe on, on, especially at home, we should have won at home. We had a few chances, I remember, and that probably would have put us in a better situation going to their place. And, um, you know, they, they had their tails up, obviously, beating us at home. And, uh, yeah, gutting really, mate, because, you know, everyone dreams of playing at Wembley. And, you know, I remember, you know, shedding the tear, to be honest, um, you know, because you never know if you'll ever get a chance again, you know. And, uh, you know, a few, a few of the other lads were the same. So, yeah, we were distraught after that game. And then we go in to 2013-14 season, the season, I guess we can call it. We played 46 league games. We won 25, drew 11, lost 10 um, in the league, finished third in a season where, at least up until January from memory, but for the most part, we looked like we were going to finish as champions. Um, we started the campaign 12 unbeaten. Um, I vaguely remember one of the Leighton Orient fans, I can't remember his uh, name, but he wasn't going to shave his beard until we lost. And it was uh, kind of an ongoing thing. Um, and we only lost three games in the opening 27 matches. But then we all know what happens. We go to play Peterborough over two games in a playoff semi-final, uh, drawing one all away in the first leg and winning 2-1 at home. And your goal from the 60th minute was in like the pre-goals that I put into this podcast. Uh, Dagnall scores in the 88th, Posh score in the 90 plus third. I didn't even know they'd scored till to this day. I don't know how they scored because we was all celebrating, ready to run on the pitch. Final whistle goes, pitch fills up. I have still to this day, I can't remember what player, but I'm pretty sure it was a uh, Brit of some longer. I've slipped and nearly taken him out, two footed him, was running on the pitch in the <laughs> stand because that was the season you got pre season ticket. So obviously, as a kid, it's a whole pre season ticket. Mum doesn't have to pay for it. Great. Um, what were your memories from that night when the pitch invasion and when everyone's going mad, we're going to Wembley. There was like, I remember vividly that old couple walking onto the pitch steadily. Yeah. Just your memory yeah, I remember from that night. Seeing the pitch after, yeah, I remember seeing that. Um, well, to, to go from the start of the season, I think we started off fantastically well, which we hadn't done for, for a few years. Um, and started to get goals from from a lot of people mo was scoring loads uh, obviously kevin lisby david mooney you know dagnall coming off the bench Sean back coming off the bench myself he had lloyd james you then had, we had a team where you were thinking hold on a minute we've got half a chance i think it got to sort of about christmas time um and obviously we were we were still up there uh, i think unfortunate for us that season we obviously had wolves and brentford who resources at the time were a lot better than ours um, and you know we, we probably fell a little bit short um, perhaps we could have maybe added a couple of players in January maybe just to freshen it up because um, we had a lot of players that played a lot of games but like you say we get we get to the playoffs and it, it's a lottery really then and obviously we went away to Peterborough I remember Russell just saying look just don't lose it boys it's don't lose the game. I fancy us to win at home, keep it tight. And I think that's pretty much how we played it. We played probably not as, as expansive as we had been uh, at the time, but we were, you know, playing within ourselves, but for a reason. Um, and obviously they nicked a goal, which obviously we needed to come out a little bit more. And obviously Mo gets us the goal that gets us, gets us the draw. And then obviously we had that. Um, we all stayed out on the pitch afterwards. And I remember Russ saying that's exactly how we wanted it. Played, played the game plan perfectly. We take them to our place. We beat them at home. We have the fans behind us. Uh, he said that, you know, I'm fully confident that we're going to win it. Um, so we went from that game to, I remember we went to a hotel and uh, we had like a cool down session, swimming pool, and we, you know, we obviously recovered properly. Uh, we did uh, analysis on that night. So we, we debriefed the game and then, uh, we obviously stayed over at the hotel and then in the morning we uh, we had a, a, the brief of how we were going to play and it was completely different to the way we played at home. You know, me and Mo were a bit more wider, more expansive. He was, uh, Russ obviously used to let me, you know, sort of come inside and roam and go where I want really. But obviously when we lost the ball, get our shape. So we were a bit more free-flowing at home and, and, and that was the game plan. And 
you know, we started off and it, again, it was cagey. Like, you know, the playoff games are always cagey. And uh, I, I did feel the first goal was was, was always going to be crucial. And, and fortunate enough for me, um, you know, I think Kev, Kev wins a free kick on the edge of the box. Where, to be honest, I was caught in two minds of what to do with it. Either try and sort of whip it. Um, but I felt, because it was so close, that I thought I'd just literally hit it as hard as I could on target. Um, and obviously there was a block in and it comes straight back to me and, you know, nicely to be fair. And I was able to, to volley it straight back in. And I mean, the feeling I got when that went in and the crowd and, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely one of the best feelings I've ever had on the football pitch, to be honest. I just, I just felt that, I don't know, the floor just lifted me up. I just, you know, it was just a feeling I, I, I could never explain, but, you know, if I could get that feeling again, I'd I'd have it every day of the week. And obviously, we went on, and, and like you say, <coughs> Dagnall and, and, and Sean Bat that that run he went on, he was so quick. I mean, he didn't get the credit he deserved. He was a machine, an absolute machine. Uh, he picked up the ball from I think from our eighteen yard box, and just he just went. And you just see a couple of Peterborough players trying, and he's just pulling away. He's pulling away. He's pulling away. I remember him cutting it back. Dagnall took a touch. You know, that was Dagonal as well. He had he had that quality in the box, Dagonal. He took that touch. He knew where he was going to put it. Thanks very much. And, you know, obviously, uh, the rest is history. I don't even remember their goal. I, I couldn't even tell you about it. You know, I, I was just sitting on the bench. Remember, I got bought off. I had, my groin was playing up for probably That's a month. Right. Before, my groin was playing up for probably the last month of that season, to be honest. And I was having injections and I was having all sorts at the time. And... Um, uh, I remember Russ before I come off he said you're going to have to come off because you, you can barely run you know he's laughing and I'm thinking you know it's a playoff playoff semi-final second leg and he's 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 cracking jokes so that was Russ though you know he he, he, he would you know try and keep your level and I just said yeah you're, you're probably right Russ get me off and I remember him saying yeah I'll get you off mate and uh, we were hopefully trying you know it was touch and go for, for, for the final really mate um and like I said, I was having injections quite regularly that month just to get me through. And um, like I said, and then obviously when, when the final whistle goes, like I said, the, the feeling, you know, like I said, if I could get that to happen again at Brisbane Road, you know, I'd, I'd pay pay very good money for, for that to happen. You know, we was all up on the stands, you know, K, Sir, R, Sir, R. And it was brilliant. The dressing room was obviously bouncing and... Uh, we obviously had a few drinks in in the gallery. Uh, you know, anyone that don't know what, what the gallery is, you'll know it, obviously, mate. But obviously, the bar in the ground was heaving. You know, parents and everyone there, everyone's families. It was it was a special, special moment. And uh, you know, it, it puts a lump in my throat now. Really talking about it, it's it was unbelievable, mate. I cannot, you know, thank Russ enough. Uh, always go back to what he said you know you never regret it and that's one of the moments where I can only be thankful to, to to be part of such a good team yeah if memory serves me correct I believe my granddad went but he was sitting somewhere else so I was with my friend and I'd always said to him from that run with when we lost against Arsenal if we get to Wembley you've got to buy me my match stick we went we're never going to get to Wembley I've been a late Honorio fan for X amount of years 2040. 50 years, how long he's been spoiling them at the time. You're not going to get to Wembley, but if we do, we'll buy a match chicken. I just remember after that game, not, oh my God, we've won. Told you, you owe me a match chicken. <laughs> <laughs> it was time for the playoff final. At a time, we didn't know that it was technically going to be a beginning of a dark time for Leighton Orient Football Club. So it was the 25th of May, 2014. We're 2-0 up to Rotherham at half time. Moses Odebadjo scores in the 35th minute and 39th minute you score yourself. I think this is the second time ever I've gone onto the highlights just to get your goal for the pre thing. I've not even watched the other goals. Second half, former Leighton Orient player Alex Ravel scores twice. Now, still to this day, I can't remember whether it's because I'd had quite a lot to drink. But for me, he was missing in that first half. I didn't even know he was playing. I thought he'd come on at half time because he come out of nowhere and scored twice. We then lose 4-3 on penalties. I've never watched them back, but just from looking at the stats, obviously it was Chris Dagnall's one that knocked us out. 
I believe. We've got the famous photo of you crying. I'm crying. I cancelled my bank holiday night out. So I'm pretty sure the game was on a Sunday from memory. How do you describe that feeling of the final whistle? And obviously, most importantly, the final days that, sorry, the following days that come. Yeah, I think we're starting with a positive. Obviously, leading up to it, we we had a great tour of, of Wembley. Uh, the boys were able to go down all together, take photos and you know, and it was it was obviously a special day and, and all the boys were were really looking forward to it. You know, nobody had played there. Um, it was going to be a new experience and we wanted to take it all in. So, you know, Russ organised the coach from the ground to take us down there, have a look around the change rooms and stuff. And, and that was all fantastic. But like you say, I think the day itself, again, you know, to, to sing the national anthem, to see you see a, your parents and your family and, and everyone in the crowd was 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 something special. Um, the first 45 minutes probably couldn't have gone any better if you'd tried. Clean sheet, two goals. Uh, it, it was set up for us. Um, and yeah, like you said, I, f- I mean, I've not, I, I, I'd never watch it back. But um, yeah, for, for what happened after was, was sickening. If I'm on it, I think that's the only way I can put it. And like you say, Alex Ravel with two goals, and then to lose on penalties is cruel, really cruel. And uh, me being an emotional guy, I am to be fair, yeah, it got the better of me. And you know, it was, it was obviously waking up. <laughs> oh, he's come knocked on the door. Sorry, I, where was I? Yeah, so and then to lose on penalties was, yeah. Uh, just, just a horrible feeling, mate. And to remember, just like you say, breaking down and obviously nothing much said really in the dressing room after. Um, remember Russ just saying, well, there's not much I can say, boys. Go away and enjoy your summer. And uh, we go again, I suppose. That was, that, was, that was his message, really. So then we're going to go through a couple of seasons, which probably aren't going to be the nicest to talk about, but I guess we've got to give the whole picture of your time at Orion. So we go into the 2015 season, uh, the first season, and to put it nicely, a crook and a wrong one in the form of Fabio Bicchetti, and I have no qualms with saying that, I would swear, but I'd like a family audience to watch this, mm-hmm. Fabio Bicchetti's era of the club. Following his purchase from Barry Hearn, so a season where we got relegated from League One, a season after being basically a kick away from the Championship, uh, we played 46, we won 12, drawing 13, losing 21. Uh, finishing on 49 points in the league. A season where Russell, Say- Russell Slade got sacked in September. We then had Kevin Nugent, Moreau, Melanzi, Fabio Libriani. A season where you played 44, scoring seven. So you're, so you're still kind of in favour at this time. Um, and then if you can kind of explain what happened that season behind closed doors, how bad it was. There was obviously the stories about the translators with the Italian managers, the Albanian TV show. I'm pretty sure the 5,000-year-old striker Plasamati joined that season as well. Mm. So really just give your kind of insight from your point of view about the atmosphere of the club in that first season of the Ketty's era. Yeah, it's difficult to... to um, to talk about, really. Well, there's, there's so much, I think... You know, from what people heard, <clears throat> Bichetti was picking the team at times. He would turn up at the training ground. He would pick the team um, from the TV show. You know, sometimes we couldn't train on the pitch because they, they had something else planned. So we wouldn't train that day. We'd just have a random day off and, you know, leading up to a game where obviously preparation should be sole focus was, was to try and stay in the league. But at the time it felt, the TV show was more important. Um, but yeah, I think for me, it was, you know, you turn up at the training ground and with a sheet of paper, hand it to the manager. That's the team that's playing at the weekend. Um, you know, for me, sometimes I was in it, sometimes I weren't like other players and it was difficult to understand, really. Um, so... Yeah, it, it, like I said, it was it was a bit of a horror show, really, mate. It was just 
something that you about. I felt like I was living in a bad dream. Uh, the majority of that season, that it was just this. Surely this isn't happening. This this is not happening to to this club. Surely, where is this going? Where is this taking us? What? How how are we going to you know sort this out um, before something happens? And obviously we get relegated. Um, and you know, like I said, from from then on, it, it seems seems to get from, from from bad to worse, really. So we'll go to the beginning of that season again. It was not a question I wrote down, but it was a question that I'd want to ask. But it's obviously followed on from your answer. Russell Slade got let go. Is that because he didn't conform to Bicetti picking the team and he'd go against it? Or did he just come in with the agenda to get rid of Slade? And how did it affect you being very close to him as well? Yeah, I, th- I think there was a bit of both. And I knew something was up because Russ was quiet for, for probably three weeks prior. Um and obviously being so close, you know, I'd, I'd say, you know, what's up? You know, you're not yourself. And he just kept saying to me, just all you've got to do, mate, keep your head down, you'll be all right. And I remember him just saying that to me and I'm thinking, well, what about you? You know, it's, and, you know, don't, it's, don't worry about me. You worry about yourself. He said, you know, you're all right. I'll make sure you're all right. And, you know, I took that from, I, 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 obviously from then I thought, you know, there was obviously half a chance of, of something happening. Um, and you know, obviously, the Notts County game, I think he pretty much knew. Um, and I think there's a picture of me when I hug him, and I remember him whispering in my ear, he said, That's me done now, mate. Good luck, you know. And I, I knew, obviously, from then, all the boys saying, Oh, what's going on? And I, I was sitting on the coach, I already knew, I, and you know, I, I didn't I didn't say anything out of respect for, for Russell and anyone else, but um, you know, I knew then that that, that was obviously uh, his time up with us. So then we go to the next season after all these shenanigans of relegation the first season. And almost this season kind of escaped my memory. I remember the season. I just don't remember how high we finished until I researched it today because you kind of, then years you want to put out your head really. We played 46 league games. Obviously, it's the 15-16 season. We won 19. We drew 12. We lost 15. Finishing eighth just outside the playoffs with 69 points. And I think that was the season where kind of Piketty almost was put, trying to push you out the door. Obviously, we'll speak about when you left the season after, after. You played 16 games, scoring five goals under Ian Hendon, which seemed to start quite well from memory. Kevin Nolan then come in and it started getting a little bit desperate and a little bit stupid. And then Andy Hessenthal, great guy, but really kind of come into the club at a very wrong time. Yeah. Like I say, the season was an odd season because despite not having a bad season on the pitch, it still felt like that atmosphere around the club was absolutely toxic. What would yeah, you take sorry. on? Yeah, it, I think that you've hit the nail on it. It, it was toxic, mate. It was, you know, uh, not, not even just for the players, for, 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 for the general, you know, with, with Lindsay Martin, the kit man, you know, Ada and, and everyone in the office, it was, you know, it was just a difficult, difficult place to work. And that they, they made the rod for their own back. And um, like I said, the relegation didn't help. But, you know, like I said, things on the pitch. I mean, you know, certain staff members being spoken to the way they were spoken to. It was down. It wasn't just what they were doing on the pitch. It was off it as well. They were just not nice people. You know, a member, you know, I, I had countless arguments with, with Francesco Buschetti. You know, you can't treat people the way you're treating them. You can't, this isn't, you know, you've come in, you know, he, he, I remember him pulling me one time, obviously with a translator this is, this isn't him speaking, just speaking to me. Um, you know, why are the people not happy? Well, we've just got relegated. What, what, what are you expecting? You know, he, he didn't seem to get to grips with it. I, I said, this club shouldn't be in League Two. They should be in the Championship. We're in our League Two. We're two leagues away now. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Well, yeah, you know, he said, I said, they're not going to like us. I said, it's not just you, it's the players as well. Until we get back up, we need to get promoted. There's no two ways about it. Right, OK, OK. You know, and then like you say, they brought in sort of players, Matty come in and obviously Joby at the time and, and Jay Simpson. Um, and obviously Joby's gone on and been a fantastic servant to, to, to the club. Um and obviously, Jay done well for us as well. They were all good players. I just think the plasmatic one was was just ridiculous. I, I mean, I don't know if, 
if the the amounts of money he was on that was quoted, I, I actually don't know that. But if he was, I mean, it, that would have been just borderline ridiculous. Um, he was he, he was a lovely lad. I mean, I got on with him, but I think it just become a bit of the lads got a bit, you know, it got a bit of a joke with certain players turning up, picking up all this money, and you know, let's be honest, he he didn't really do great for us. But like I said, he just didn't seem to get to grips. You know, like I said, of speaking to Francesco, and he, for whatever reason, he always used he asked for the players' numbers. I remember this. This was a strange one. He asked for everyone's number, and he used to text me sometimes. And I remember he texted me to to and asked me to go to his house. I mean, just weird. But anyway, I went training and went to his. He wanted to know um, what was up, and obviously I said about getting relegated. I just don't what what I don't get is he just didn't have a. You know, I said to him, what's your plan? What do, what do you want to achieve while you're here? Well, you know, obviously we've got the, the music band and I said, like, no, 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 I'm talking about football. What, 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 where, do, where do you want to go? Well, we want to do well. I said, well, that's good. That's a good start. You want to do well. So we just got relegated. We need to get promoted. Oh, well, how do we do that? I said, well, you need to go and sign some players. If you want help, I can help you. You know, but obviously we had, we had directors of football and, um, his other uh, people that he brought across with him that were living with him at the time. Um, and he didn't, he didn't, he didn't want the help. I mean, offered it, uh, you know, I think, I think a few of the other lads, you know, we knew the league. I'd been in the league long enough. I knew the players, you know, obviously he was prepared to dig it. I mean, that is one thing he did do. He did dig in his pocket. I'll give him that, but obviously he just done it ridiculously stupid. Um, but yeah, from what, from my, my main moment, it was just felt like a bad dream. And, you know, it was, it was the one time I really questioned, did I want to be at, be at Leighton Orient, really? Because it got to a point where, you know, like I said, it, it wasn't a football club. It, it was a bit of a circus. You turn up and you try and be as professional as you can. And he would turn up and he'd change this. And I remember they brought in a fitness coach who, well, he was just rubbish. I think that's the only way I can say it. The, some of the, some of the, stuff we were doing, the lads are looking at each other thinking, what's he doing? You know, we could put better on, you know, sort of warm up stuff and fitness stuff, you know, but just thinking, what, what, what is this? You know, look, everyone's looking at each other. Problem was, was everyone felt so angry about it, but what, what could you physically do? You know, it, we were paid to play for Leighton Orient Football Club. So you're not going to kick up a fuss, too much of a fuss. Don't get me wrong. I used to, Used to argue with him, like, what are we doing? This, you know, we ain't kids, mate. Get, get out there, get organised, and get this done properly. But only so many times you could do that. Um, and I weren't proud of doing it, but you know, the lads are looking at each other. You know, we're thinking, well, what, what are we doing even coming in? This is just ridiculous. We could do this in our back garden. It was just, I, I, honestly, mate, it was so frustrating. And I think in the end, I think I remember doing an interview, and it might have been. Barnsley away or someone I can't remember who it was but and they was and I think I just ended up exploding and just saying look you know when they take team talks they're having to wait for an interpreter you know he was giving out instructions then the interpreter would take five minutes to store it in his head then come back out with it to relay it on and you know it, was, it just wasn't ideal I think if 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 he'd, if he'd tried to take English lessons which again I, I advised and I think a few people others did you need to take, you know, we, we need to be able to communicate with you, mate. And you need to be able to cu communicate with the fans. And that was another big thing that I used to say. You know, he used to make spur of the moment decisions and just put things on the website. And I just said, listen, you have to do this in a controlled, engage with the fans. You can't just, you know, the fans are the club. But he just didn't get it. He just did not get it. And, you know, I, I'm trying to tell him all this and I'm just, I'm just a player. You know, I'm not paid to tell him to do this and... You know, I, I did it because I cared and I knew, I knew full well what happened was going to happen. But the problem was, mate, how did you stop it? And that, and that's where, you know, to this day, could I have done more? Possibly. Do you know what? Maybe I should have tried to take him on a bit more and force the issue and sort of said to him, listen, mate, you ain't... And, and to be fair, it did get that in the end and we'll probably get onto that soon. When when, when I was uh, asked to leave, yeah. uh, you know, I, I thought, you know what, this is my time and I... I mean, I just, yeah, I mean, I told him exactly what I thought. So, yeah, like you say, we go into the next season, a season where we got relegated to the League Two, arguably my worst 
season as a Lake Norian fan. You, well, it depends on the way you look at it. It was Paquette's final season. In hindsight, maybe you would have liked to have stayed for that season, knowing what was going to happen after um, with all this stuff. But you was released on the 1st of September. There was rumours that you was going to get sold, and then you didn't get sold. And naturally, as a fan, not knowing what you're going through as a player, which I hope we'll talk about in a minute, I was so excited. You're not getting sold. He's back in the squad, released a day later. So you were on September the 1st, so you couldn't, I don't know how the Crawley stuff worked, but obviously you couldn't play for them until January 2017. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. So he went to Burgess Hill and played a couple of games for them. And then I got excited because I thought he was going to play for Burgess Hill against Harlow, but you'd left before that game. I said, like, for God's sake. I actually remember when you left, the day you left, I, I, I admit it, I was, well, I'm in my early 20s then. Yeah, it must be in my early 20s, 2016. I, I was in tears in my bedroom. And I actually went to the, because I was in crying because I was like, well, I've got tickets to Morecambe away. I'm not going to see him. We all, obviously won. And obviously this was before we got on like a communication level. So it's kind of strange. Like I didn't understand why you weren't playing. I was like, he's one of the best players at the club. Why is he not playing? But I guess that was my point of view as an outsider looking in and obviously a horrible season when we thought late in Oregon we were going to go bust before we got taken over. But for you, how was that time in September actually leaving the club, August, September? And did leaving Leighton Orient actually affect you mentally, or was it just a case of one of these things? So I imagine being six years somewhere, it's going to affect yeah, you. yeah. No, I think I think for me, I'd just come back. I'd done my cruciate ligament, and I'd just come back. Um, and I remember scoring against Stevenage, so I thought, oh yeah, I'm back now. You know, I've sort of got my goal. I'm feeling fit. Um, and we had a game against. Uh, it might have been who was it at home. I can't remember who it was. We were playing someone at home and I was supposed to be playing. I remember, you know, like I said, I remember this vividly. Turning up, I was in the team because we'd done team shake the day before. I walk into the dressing room and uh, my uh, my shirt's not up. So obviously I was thinking, oh, something's not right here. And obviously said to Ada, you know, where's my shirt, mate? You know, he said, oh, mate, I've, I don't know, honestly. I really don't know, but I was asked to take it down. I said, like, okay, no problem. So obviously Andy Hesson Tyler at the time sort of knocked on the door. I said, you know, Gaffer, what's what's going on? He said, oh, listen, mate, there's there's a situation. He said, um, you need to go upstairs uh, to see the chairman. So I said, oh, okay. So obviously I, I alarm bell started ringing then, obviously. Uh, I looked at my phone, I had a few missed calls from my agent. I was thinking, right, something's definitely not right. So I thought, well, before I go up there, I'm going to ring my agent. Luckily enough, I got hold of him and he said, all right, mate, yeah, I need you to contact you. Um, they've, they've agreed to sell you to Northampton. I said, well, I don't know anything about it. What, what do you mean? Yeah. Said, yeah, they agreed it. I believe the figure was 400 grand. Um, he's basically told me, if you don't go, you're never going to kick a ball again for Leighton Orient and you're rotting the reserves, youth team, uh, et cetera. Um, so obviously that, that, that moment on... I'm, I'm just, I'm literally, I'm on the pitch on my phone and I'm thinking, well, what, what's going on here? So I've gone, all right, well, I'll call you back. Give me a moment. So I'm obviously, I'm, to be fair, the boys hadn't turned up yet. I was there a little bit earlier. Yeah. So I'm walking around the pitch and I'm thinking, what's going on here? What, you know, what, how's it got to this? You know, I've just been, been, been out injured for eight months. I've been working, you know, my socks off to get back, to get back in the squad. Um, and then now this. So obviously I've had to go upstairs and, sort of sat down and listened to, to what he had to say. And, you know, I remember walking in and him and five others, quite intimidating really, to be honest, with just me. Um, I didn't have my agent at the time. He couldn't, he couldn't come in. He just said, look, don't agree anything, don't sign anything, don't do anything. Listen to what they've got to say and walk out. No problem, I'll do that. So obviously we started speaking to him. And <clears throat> yeah, obviously slowly but gradually got the gist of, of exactly what they wanted you know, he told me, you know, the contract I was on was, you're on too much money. Obviously, I said to him, but well, that was what you offered me. It wasn't, you know, you agreed to it as long as, uh, as well as me. Um, and then uh, he said, you got to go. I said, well, I'm not going. I've got two years left on my contract. So I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. I want to play here. Uh, we've agreed to sell you. Uh, Northampton expecting you tomorrow. Obviously, this is all via interpreters. Uh, they're expecting you tomorrow. I said, well, you can tell them I won't be there. 
I said, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you now, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I want to stay. And I'm really enjoying it. I love it here. This is, you know, this is my club. I don't, don't want to go. And obviously, he he said what he said. And, you know, I could tell then that I was fighting a bit of a losing battle, really, mate. I, I knew that he, that he meant business with, with not playing, which concerned me. Obviously, he'd done a little bit with Joby at the time. Um, so I was thinking, well, if he's done it to him, is he going to do it to me? What makes me any different? So I remember um, getting the train. I remember, yeah, so I remember coming out of that meeting and by the time I'd walked from the ground to um, Leighton Station, I had a few missed calls from uh, Vito. Do you remember him? He was there. The, yeah, maybe, yeah. He's the, the chairman's... I don't know. He's the bloke that done his stuff, really, the dirty work, I suppose. Um, yeah, you know, and I didn't pick up, uh, but I called him back just before I got on the train and he said, look, look, we want you to come back. You know, we want you to sign the papers. We want to release you. I said, no, no, no way. Not coming. So I put the phone down and uh, obviously got the train, obviously living in Overteeth, so obviously Central Line of Bank and Bank to London Bridge and, and London Bridge home and, you know, on... on on that time, I'd obviously spoken to my agent again and spoke to mum and dad and sort of thinking, you know, I've got I've got to make a bit of a decision here. Sorry, mate. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I had to, uh, yeah, speak to mum and dad. I mean, again, it was, the problem with me, it was, I really didn't want to go. And, you know, that, that's hand on heart. Did not want to go, but just could not. Couldn't, I couldn't really see a way out, mate, if I'm honest. I just didn't. If I stayed, you know, he was, I didn't know he was going to go. I mean, if I knew, if I had a crystal ball and he was going to go and the new owners were going to come in, listen, if I'd known that, I would have stuck it out, you know, at 100%. But, you know, for me, I just couldn't see any any other way. And, and like I said, in the end, we ended up agreeing uh, to leave by mutual consent. Um but they didn't send the paperwork till after the transfer window, which again was a bit of a kick in the teeth because, you know, then I couldn't go and play for a football league side till the following January. Um, so, I mean, and like you say, for me mentally, you know, I'm not going to lie, it did knock me because, you know, I'd, I'd been somewhere where I'd loved playing football. You know, I felt wanted, I felt part of it. Um, and again, it was in, it, it never really been in that position where, I was a free agent, you know, obviously when I was at Brighton, I, I had a contract, but I just left because I wasn't playing. And obviously at Orient, you know, I, I'd been there for six years. So I, I had a bit of stability really. And obviously to then come out of leaving Leighton Orient, I was sort of just left to my own device and, you know, I couldn't play. And, you know, it took me a while to be fair to, to get my head around it. Um, and the agent just said, well, why don't you just go and play locally? I thought, do you know, do you know what? Why not? You know, I went and played for Burgess Hill, like you said, and you know, I didn't ask for any money. I just, it was just the opportunity to to go and play, really, and and and, and to be honest, just get my love back for it, really. Um, you know, I, I knew a few of them because living locally, so it was, it, it, it seemed at the time a good decision, and um, then obviously, I think around around October time. Uh, Dermot Dr Drummy, uh, God bless his soul, um, gave me a call and said that he'd, he'd like to, to at least speak to me about going to Crawley. And obviously for me, you, you know where I am, Jake, I'm, I'm, I'm local to Crawley. So for me, again, <clears throat> the, the sort of stabilisation of being at home um, and, and being around my family, um, obviously went and spoke to him and, 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 you know, liked what he said and, you know, we agreed a, a two and a half year deal there. So it was, it wasn't what I wanted, you know, and, and, you know, I, Crawley fans will know this already, but I wasn't really over leaving, if I'm honest, for at least sort of the first sort of six months, you know, I was still, still felt weird, you know, uh, it just, it just didn't feel right. But obviously in the end, you, you have to get on with it. That's football. But yeah, it was, it obviously wasn't, 
wasn't the way I wanted it to end. And, you know, I, I'd written a nice statement that I wanted to put out on the website, you know, that was heartfelt and, you know, he wouldn't let that come out. And, you know, it was a bit, I think for me, it was, I, I felt really harshly treated and listen, I'm over it now. Life moves on, but, you know, to not have the decency to let me at least say thanks to the fans. I mean, you know, I, I, I I wasn't really bothered if I saw Francesco Bichetti again. You know, yeah. in the whole negotiations of leaving, it well, I didn't even speak, I didn't speak a word to him. I wasn't interested, you know. And um, you know, I'd ha- I had to make my mind up. And, and like I said, when, when I uh, eventually I had to go down to to sign some paperwork, and I remember um, just before I'd seen Ada, and me, me and Ada walked around the pitch for about twenty minutes to half an hour, and. To be fair, we were both a bit upset and, I, you know, I sort of said to him, listen, thanks ever so much for everything you've done. And um, I was able to do that. You know, he, he looked after me as good as anyone there, really, Ada. He was fantastic, along with Lindsay. The, the pair of them, absolutely, I cannot speak highly enough of them. And I must admit, during the time that Francesco was there, they, them two probably were single-handedly running that football club. Yeah. Because the others did not know what they were doing. You know, it was some of the decision making, you know, it was scary. You know, they were doing all of it. And like I said, you know, I was able to see him and, you know, I was emotional. You know, I'm not I'm not um, too proud to say. Obviously, once I signed and, you know, the, the, walk, the walk back from the stadium to, 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 to Leighton Tube Station was horrific, really. I was, you know, in tears. And I remember, you know, ringing my agent and just saying, you know, I've... I don't think I should have done that. I can't believe I've done that. And um, I remember as well, it's funny, I said to him, if you can ever get me back here, you've got to. And I don't care if it's whatever. You know, I'll, I'll do whatever to get back here. Um, but yeah, it was it was, it was was hard, mate. It was really hard. And obviously getting getting back, but obviously I was so thankful to, to, to Dermot Drummy uh, to sign me. And, you know, I, I uh, yeah, like I said, I, Thankful to get another two years really in, in, in professional football. So obviously we we are a bit pressed for time. So I'm going to roll like the last kind of questions into like almost one. So we go to 2018. Uh, you joined Eastbourne Borough. Uh, obviously you remain there now. I I could be wrong, but for me as an outsider looking in, that to me, like judging from your tweets, looked like when you started enjoying football again. Would you say that was the right thing since you moved from Leighton Orient? Eastbourne yeah, yeah, definitely, and obviously, you know, between between that time and now, I've, you know, I've, I've had a child, and you know, you you grow up, and but you know, like I say, to to to, to then be able to go back to Eastbourne, obviously, I was there on loan at, at eighteen years old. You know, I knew the club, and listen, there's some fantastic people down there, and like I said, I'm I'm really enjoying it. We've got a great set of lads. The manager's fantastic, um, and the board there. Uh, are, are brilliant too and you know I fit in well I'd like to think you know they enjoy me down there as much as I enjoy being there um, and like you say yeah really enjoying being there and like I said we've had a good start to the season and we'll hope we can maintain that that'll be our challenge now to to hopefully keep that going for the majority of the season but it's certainly been a great start for us and obviously this is called Talking Life so we better take you away from football for like the kind of the final question uh, you're now married you're a dad and you're also a foster dad. So um, how did meeting your wife obviously change your life? And what was the inspiration of becoming a you know, foster father? Obviously, I know you've had a child, but actually a foster father. And what does being a foster dad entail? Because to me, it looks like it almost kind of fit in place. You've lost, you've left Leighton Orient, you've had Crawley, you've met your wife, you've had your kids, and it's almost like life's good again. Do you know what I mean? How is it from your point of view with that? Yeah, I think it's something that we'd, we'd always considered doing um, because Lu- Louise's, Louise's mum's done it for, for 15 years. So obviously going over there, we'd, we'd, we'd obviously meet um, her foster children. And uh, it was always something in the back of, back, back of our minds, really. And obviously w- w- once I left uh, Crawley, we were sort of halfway through the stage of, of, of becoming uh, approved foster carers and uh, you know it was a, a long process it, took, it takes about eight to nine months but um, we obviously get, the timing of it like you say we, we just had Ayla we'd just been accru- uh, approved uh, foster carers and obviously 
then moving to Eastbourne with obviously it being part time, um, obviously allowed me to be around more to obviously help help Louisa because we've got two two foster children. Um, so obviously a bit of a handful for her with with with, with Ayla as well. So, like you said, I think it it. it it, sometimes in life it, it's it, it, some things just fall into place and I think at that moment in time it just ticks every box and um, it was always something we were going to do but we probably maybe fast-tracked it a little bit considering what was going on at, at Crawley you know I didn't want to come out of uh, full-time football and not really you know a lot of people speak about falling back on stuff and you know that's able you know uh, enabled us to do that and obviously for me to then you know I could have Possibly, you know, I had a few uh, offers to stay in the league or, or play in the National League. But like I said, it got to a point where, you know, the, the Ayla and, and, and obviously my wife now, it, it became a bit more about them. Um, you know, I, I could have gone and played for someone and probably had to move away. And, and, and I didn't want to do that. I've, you know, I've had a great time bringing up Ayla. I've, I've, you know, I've been around most days. Um, you know, not, not everyone gets that opportunity. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful for that. You know, I've, I've been able to see her, you know, since she was born, really, to now. And, uh, you know, I am around uh, quite a lot, probably to annoyance of my wife a little bit. <laughs> probably, probably a bit too much. But, you know, I think becoming a foster dad is 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 difficult. It does have its challenges. It's not as easy as it as it sounds, obviously, for, for you know, going on, 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 on me, you know, obviously two extra bodies in the house and, it's um, something to get uh, accustomed to and, and get used to. But, um, you know, it's also very re rewarding at the same time. You know, when they come here, you know, certain things that they couldn't do, they can do. They can read better now. They can write better. Uh, their behaviours got better. You know, you get little milestones that you tick off and you think, do you know what, you know, I've, I'm, I'm helping helping them on the way to do this. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a really... Uh, self-satisfaction really obviously you're not it's not where you've got a boss that's coming around other jobs sort of saying oh you're doing a good job but you can see the the improvements in front of your eyes really you know they've we've moved moved, moved schools for them and you know they've come on really leaps and bounds this year so it's been uh it's very different don't get me wrong to to, to play in professional football <laughs> and, um you know it's probably you know if anyone asked me they probably wouldn't believe I'd be doing it and Perhaps, I, you know, even I didn't think, you know, but I think in life things change and opportunities arise and um, Louisa was really keen to do it. And, um, you know, so I jumped on board and I'm really glad I have. And we've, you know, from from the day that they've been with us, uh, it's been, been nothing but happiness, really. And, uh, you know, trying to nurture them and help them and, you know, encourage them to... to to dream big and, 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 you know, like make life what, what, what they can make it. And, you know, we'll always be there to support them. So a question I've actually got, this will be the last question now, but from obviously your answer, there is sometimes um, like a little bit of a gray line between fostering and adoption. So obviously adoption from my knowledge is if you adopt a child, they are essentially yours until forever. They pretend they become your child. With foster kids, is there like is there a plan to obviously adopt these, or is it to get them to a level where they can find a permanent adoption family? What's your kind of role with that? Yeah, so so, for, so fostering, yeah, obviously, um, is sometimes it can be for one night, two nights. It's an emergency; they need somewhere you know really quickly, or you know, with with the children that we've got, we've actually got permanency, so they will be with us till they're 18. Um, so their long-term future at the moment will be with us. And yeah, I think that'll be something that we, we will revisit. Um, you know, when they're older, they may want to go and do their own thing. And, and, and that's absolutely fair play to them. They may have aspirations and, and but you know, I, I think, you know, not, knowing my wife, um, perhaps, you know, adoption, could put, could be a possibility, you know. We we definitely, if they weren't ready to go, that we there's no way we would let them, you know. We I treat them like they're my, you know, they're my own. So, you know, there's no way I'd um, let them go if, if they didn't want to. So that door will always be open. But we know we've got them till they're 18, and um, I think that's good because you know we can mould them and and 
you know, the experiences, that, the bad experiences, obviously, they've had to come into foster care. Um, we can hope to, to, to sort of help, um, you know, talk about it, get their emotions out and, 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 and try and learn to deal with it. Um, I've just done a, a therapeutic course um, for, for, for foster children. So, you know, to, to sort of help uh, myself and, and Louisa, we, we have to do training quite on a regular basis to, you know, uh, certain strategies that you can use and um, to help them. But, you know, lo and behold, they've, they've been all right. And, you know, don't get me wrong, there's been hard days and, and there'll be more to come, I'm sure. But I think if you embrace it, um, same as, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes you making your debut is the same thing. You, you, you've got to embrace the debut in football and you go for it. And, 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 and similar to, to what I've done uh, with fostering, you know, it's out of my comfort zone. I'm not going to lie. It wasn't something I'd, I'd imagine myself doing, but it's probably now. I, wouldn't, I couldn't imagine me not doing now. You know, I'll I, I get such um, self-satisfaction over it and um, seeing the success that the boys have made in uh, at some of the time that they've been with us. Um, it's been great. Okay, well, unfortunately, I think we could go on for hours and hours. That's all we've got time for. So uh, thank you for watching the Jake Murphy Media YouTube channel. This has, of course, been at the uh, Talking Life series, this episode with Dean Cox. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Please like, share and subscribe. And uh, thank you very much, Dean, for coming on. Thanks, mate.